Welcome to New York Public Health Now, where we talk about the why so you can decide what to do. Hello, I'm Dr. Jim McDonald, Commissioner of the New York State Department of Health, talking to you today from the 14th floor of Corning Tower, overlooking the Empire State Plaza here in downtown Albany. Today, very happy to have a special guest, Dr. John Morley, our Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Primary Care and Health Systems Management. Before we talk to Dr. Morley, I want to first welcome back Joanne Morin, our Acting Executive Deputy Commissioner here at the New York State Department of Health and co-host of New York Public Health. Now, Joanne, how are you today? Good morning. I'm wonderful. Thank you. It's interesting to me that when we do record these, it's often sunny here, which is just, I think, wonderful. It's just a beautiful sunny day here, which is great. So we're going to talk to Dr. Morley in just a second. And Dr. Morley is, you know, often I talk about defining public health as helping all the people all the time. Dr. Morley is one of the people who helps all the people all the time, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So Dr. Morley is a native New Yorker, born in the Bronx, and grew up in Westchester. And Dr. Morley, Met fan or Yankee fan? Help me understand that. Oh, definitely Yankee fan. Sorry, but I grew up seven miles from Yankee Stadium. When I was seven, I knew number seven. I knew the batting averages, the lineups. I knew everything about the Yankees that that. there was to know at that time. So you knew number seven, but you knew Joe DiMaggio. So uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him. I'm not, I guess, I, for medical privacy reasons, I guess I can't say too much, except that he was a patient in 1982 that I met. That's awesome. See, as a doctor, the people you meet, the places you go. And speaking of places of where you go, so after college and medical school, let's see, you, you trained in anesthesia at St. Barnabas Hospital in New Jersey and internal medicine at Albany Medical Center right here. And after completing that training, uh, you're appointed medical director of the pre-anesthesia screening unit at the Albany Medical Center and assistant professor of anesthesia, internal medicine, and critical care. And you're board certified not just in internal medicine, but also pulmonary and critical care medicine. And you started your career in public service in 2005 when you joined us here at the Department of Health as the medical director for our Office of Health Systems Management. You're currently our deputy commissioner of primary care and health systems management and after a long and impressive career, you are retiring, which I, you know, I'm happy for you that you're retiring. Uh, you know, I think the gift you have been to New York State is, is just a wonderful gift. And I, I want people to know that story. Uh, so I'm really thrilled to have you on our podcast today. Uh, Commissioner, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here today with you and to have been part of your team and to be in public service during some of these challenging times. Uh, the last few years has been particularly challenging. Yeah, they have been challenging. And I, I did read that long introduction about you. Was there anything about your introduction I left out? Anything anybody would want to find interesting? Tell me more, please. Well, uh, I guess, you know, if you're going to know something about somebody, you may actually want to start one generation earlier. So um, I'm the, uh, an immigrant, and, and these days that's a, a word that's in the press quite a bit. Uh, my parents were immigrants from Ireland. I am the first person in my family to get uh, a college education. I have a sister who's an attorney. And so my family is uh, a lot to me, and you really can begin to understand me if you start to understand some of that background and, and my roots and where I came from. That's, that's incredible. That background uh, just says a lot about you, right? Can you uh, tell us, what have you been doing since you've been at the New York State Department of Health, and how did you get started here? Well, that is a story about how I was got started here. So, you know, you talk about helping people, so when I was at... Uh, I was the chief medical officer at Albany Medical Center, and the phone rang one day as it was, and I was somebody from the health department that was looking for some information, and I provided some clinical assistance at that time, and I thought, okay, that's, you know, I took care of the issue, and that's all there is to it. Well, a week later, I got another phone call and was asked if I could come in and talk to some folks uh, about this particular problem and try to help understand why it was a challenge to deal with this particular issue at the time. And so I I was a a little reluctant, to be honest, because it wasn't my area of expertise, but I'm always willing to talk to folks, as you know about me. So I I came over to the department and to a conference room that's just about 20 feet from us. And in the room was the executive deputy commissioner and the head of the Office of Professional Medical Conduct, the head of the Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement, uh, the chief of staff, um, and a few other folks. And I spent an hour talking to them. Uh, One of the people was the deputy commissioner for OHSM at the time. And when we completed talking about the issues, I said to some folks, have you got people from in in the department that have been in the practice of medicine and have been around? It was a challenge at that time to identify folks and to recruit folks, but I said I might be interested. 
And uh, we talked a little bit more, and I thought, I'm really interested to provide some specific experience from inside the practice of medicine and bring that to the department. I think the folks here are obviously bright, intelligent, well-educated people who are always, always trying to do the right thing. But knowing how medicine is practiced from the hospital side, from the physician side, all of the different professions, uh, does add something that was missing at that time at that level. So they offered me the position of the medical director for OHSM, and I was very happy to be able to take that opportunity. It was a real privilege, real privilege at that time to be able to work with that level of expertise, but bring something of significant contribution to the discussion. And you said OHSM, is that the Office of Health Systems Management? That is correct. Currently, the Office of Primary Care and Health Systems Management, at that time it was referred to as just Office of Health Systems Management. Primary care was added around 2012. Well, Dr. Morley, we're glad that offer was made. Can you talk a bit more, though, about the office? What does it do? Who does it serve? So uh, we serve the people of New York as we all do in the health department, and we're proud to say that. We're happy to say that. That's really what we came here for, to do. So you've got a section of the department that, uh, you know, some people would refer to as the good guys who run the vaccine clinics and epidemiology and so forth. We are the tougher side uh, who has to understand the regulations and hold regulated account uh, licensed entities accountable for the work that they do. That's, for the most part, um, institutions, facilities, so hospitals, um, diagnostic and treatment centers, uh, anything that that we've given a license to, minus now we have the Office of Aging and Long-Term Care that does long-term care entities, but we also oversee professional medical practice for physicians, physician's assistants, specialist assistants, And it includes medical students who may not be licensed, but we still are required to oversee their efforts and the work that they do, which is under somebody else's uh, license when they're in an approved training program. We have funeral homes. We have emergency medical services. We have the Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement, uh, which is an area that's uh, increasingly busy uh, over the last few years. Uh, the The pandemic that comes to mind first is Uh, COVID, I think, in most people's mind, but the one that's been around the longest and continues to go unabated is the uh, narcotic opioid overdose issue. And we've got some significant resources to bring to the table, to the discussion, uh, to add to the the fight against uh, opioids and substance abuse. Our prescription monitoring program is one just one small piece to that, but we have expertise that joins with law enforcement to attempt to address that. So we've got a very broad reach over a lot of different areas. Um, New York State is a certificate of need state, and we've got an Office of Financial Planning that oversees the certificate of need process for hospitals and DNTCs and so forth. I think that's a smattering of what we do, um, and I'm sure I'm leaving some things out. One of the biggest functions of any state health department is to be a regulator, to assure the public that health care in your state is safe. And so we do regulate a lot of people. And, you know, you really did a nice summary of a lot of the different groups of people and facilities that we regulate. So I want to shift our conversation a little bit about one of your other roles, which is regarding hospitals. And I don't think it's any secret that many hospitals in New York State are struggling financially. You know, and I think I'd just like to understand a little bit from your point of view. You've been doing this a long time. You have a unique role here. You see the picture as a physician who's practiced medicine in hospitals for many years, but also as a regulator. Why do you think so many hospitals in New York State are struggling? So uh, let me begin that by going back four or five years pre-COVID. New York State was uh, was about number 49, I think, in terms of, of uh, net revenue for hospitals. Uh, their margins were about 1%. And uh, New York is a competitive environment. It's a tough, tough place in terms of competition. So if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere? Uh, you could say that, yes. I could say that, yeah. Yes, then along comes COVID, and, and obviously the challenges were profound. Um, New York took uh, hits on COVID early and often. Uh, people from around the world uh, come into New York City, and we're, we frequently see things that are in another part of the world um, a, a pop up and appear because they arrive on, an, on a, a flight for, through JFK or through LaGuardia. 
Um, so COVID hit New York City particularly bad. Uh, the, the density of the population was part of the impact that was there. Um, the staff, uh, you know, some of them were concerned about their own health. So anybody that had a health issue or was over 60 said, you know, I'm not sure I want to go through this, uh, this battle and this pandemic. And so some folks decided to retire early. Uh, that left um, an insufficient number of people really to try and provide the care that was necessary for all of the impact of COVID through hospitals and uh, other regulated entities. So it was a, a challenging environment. And I know that a lot of people felt stressed by the whole challenge. Um, some people sought some additional compensation for that. Prices went up. Uh, that was a struggle for us that you know, some people decided that I'm not going to do this for just the usual amount of money and risk my life dealing with COVID. So if I can make more money, so prices went up profoundly. Hospitals were in the middle of contracts with payers, so it was hard for them to negotiate or impossible in some cases to negotiate with payers to be able to meet the increasing cost of running a hospital. Um, we're seeing some of that now as people come into uh, the end of contracts and are renegotiating. They're asking for substantial increases in reimbursement. The, the COVID crisis is certainly a major, major part in that. Uh, the staffing shortages, whenever there's a shortage of something, prices go up. And all of the people working in healthcare have, uh, you know, we're, we're short staffed in every area. The laboratories, in radiology, nursing is the one that first comes to mind. But, you know, even in uh, physicians, um, we're seeing shortages that we don't have sufficient numbers to meet the demands of the patient. So people are working very, very hard, and the ones that are still there with us uh, remain committed and remain willing to do what it takes, but they've got li limitations. They just have some limitations. I mean, it sounds like one of the things I'm hearing you tell me, one of the challenges all the hospitals face is just paying labor costs. And, you know, we saw agency contract labor was extremely expensive during the pandemic. Uh, but just quite frankly, it drove up costs for paying labor. Everyone from nurses to lab techs to doctors, just hospital costs have risen, um, and that's just a challenge. And it's labor, and it is some staff, but it wasn't just that. So the pro cost of supplies uh, started to go up as well. So the cost of everything in running a hospital went profoundly up, and reimbursement didn't change a lot. Mm. So recognizing or acknowledging all of those challenges, what are some of the ways that the state is able to assist? So we are working with state education and we're, we've got our new Center for Workforce Innovation that we're looking to uh, address the staffing uh, shortage that we have. We're working with colleges, encouraging hospitals to be working with them and encouraging the young folks to be thinking about going into healthcare. We want more people early on. Unfortunately, many of the things that we deal with aren't going to happen overnight, and so it's going to take us a few years. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're trying to be as supportive as we can as workers, and we have supported the wage increases we've seen develop over the last couple of years. So all of that has been positive in terms of, of helping folks. We also want to bring folks in from other areas in the country and from across the planet. So we're looking at mechanisms to uh, improve access through visas, and working with um, federal licensing agencies to see what we can do about encouraging folks to be able to practice in any state that they want. Um, improve access through telemedicine. And telemedicine was certainly available before COVID hit us, but COVID caused an explosion of uh, the use of telemedicine. And we are seeing that begin to wane a little bit but we're trying to be as supportive as we, as we can of it continuing because it does improve access for patients for sure. And it increases efficiency. There are some people who absolutely unequivocally want to live only in New York City, but there are people in rural communities struggle to find somebody and the people in the city, the physicians, um, have extra time because there is in some areas a surplus so they can provide telemedicine consultation to rural areas where there's a shortage of staff. So I think that's just some of what it is that we're doing to increase staffing, short-term telemedicine, scope of practice, working with state education, long-term encouraging the development of additional programs in schools, 
allowing schools to utilize, and this was working again with state education, I want to emphasize that, simulation training so that uh, where training at one time was 100% at the bedside and should never ever go away, but I'm not sure that 100% of your training needs to be in. Uh, pilots have demonstrated that and uh, a lot of other professions have seen a value to simulation training and so we're encouraging folks to consider some of the training being uh, not at the bedside of a patient but in simulation labs um, where you can have a different type of experience that is synergistic with training at the bedside. You know I think you've highlighted well that we're doing a lot with state ed we're working on changes to scope of practice, helping with staffing. I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about how does the state help hospitals financially? Because there are several programs where, I mean, New York State actually subsidizes hospitals really quite a bit each year. Could you just help explain that a little bit? Oh, well, I can I can try, but that is a, a very long story because there's a great deal that is happening in that space. So let me first mention uh, Danny has been around for a while and the money has gone up in Danny. Danny is Danny is doctors, doctors across New York. Sounds like a person, but it's actually a loan repayment program. That's correct. And we now have $10 million in that fund that's available to underserved communities to encourage physicians to come there and then have their loans for a school reimbursed. So if we do Danny something program. for doctors, do we do anything for nurses? Nanny. The legislature passed the Nurses Across New York program about two years ago. Uh, it's a smaller amount, but like it started out with uh, Danny for the physicians, we expect that this will grow. And again, it's a loan repayment program so that um, they're encouraged to go to underserved areas to work and then have their loans repaid. So we do loan repayment assistance, which I think is a great thing, and you know, other states do that as well. How do we subsidize hospitals directly? I, there's all these different programs you hear about. And you know, my my understanding of acronyms isn't that good, but there's, there's this thing called DPT, VAP, VAP, AP. Can you tell me quickly, what are those three things and how do they work? Not all hospitals are eligible from the, for them because fortunately there are some hospitals that aren't in need of those. But the hospitals that are identified as being in need that are struggling for any number of different reasons uh, to balance their accounts and to uh, have a net revenue. Uh, DPT is direct payment template. It's a program available through Medicaid and it does have a requirement of a spe specific percentage of the population served being Medicaid patients. We're seeing more hospitals begin to apply for a DPT direct payment template through the Medicaid program working and it, it, some of that money is coming from the federal government so it has to involve and, and obtain approval from CMS for each applicant. Uh, VAP and VAPAP have been around for several years. The Vital Access Provider Program and Vital Access Provider Assurance Programs have some federal backing um, for the, I think it's the, I always get this mixed up, VAP has federal subsidy and VAPAP does not. But again, for hospitals who are in need, who are struggling financially, those are applications that they can request additional uh, state subsidy uh, for their uh, ongoing operations. Then we've got the statewide healthcare transformation grant system. That is a, has already given out billions of dollars. We've had statewide one, two, three, and we're currently at statewide healthcare transformation for facilities four. Five is on the drawing board. It's out, it's out there in the legislature. We're taking some money and borrowing it from five, moving it into four. But we're talking about uh, approximately $1.5 billion in assistance to hospitals to be able to transform. It is the statewide healthcare transformation system after all. So when they come up with ideas how to advance care, improve care, transform care, we saw it through DISRIP, so D-S-R-I-P, that was a program that we obtained money from the federal government about 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. Delivery system reform incentive payments, um, it was a system that encouraged hospitals and healthcare entities to work together to improve care, and it was about value purchasing, value contracts, 
mechanisms that would reimburse differently instead of by quantity, number of interactions, but by quality, by outcomes, so that providers would receive more money if they were able to keep patients from visiting the emergency rooms, reducing admissions. We learned a lot from that program. And we're still seeing that there's a number of private entities that are continuing to support valued contracting. Learning from DISRIP and from value contracting, we know that bringing internists, bringing family practitioners, bringing primary care providers together with mental health actually improves substantially outcomes. So prior to DISRIP or in, in the standard system, if a primary care provider identifies that a patient has some concerns with depression or anxiety, any mental health disorder, they might give them the name of somebody to contact and then it's up to them to go home and obtain a phone number perhaps or maybe they've got a phone number and make a call and make an appointment. What we started to see through DISRIP and through bringing folks together that was a step in the, a very, very large step in the right direction to improve outcomes was that in the same offices, in the same buildings, you had primary care providers and mental health providers. So when the patient needs to see a mental health provider, they literally could take a few steps in one direction or the other, shake hands with the person and schedule their appointment. There was no having to get a phone number. There's no having to go find and look where is that office and worrying about getting lost. Will they get there? They get to meet the provider. They get to develop a, a relationship with a, it's very brief, but that encouraged folks to seek the help that they needed for mental health issues. And when we provide care for medical issues and mental health issues together, we have a significant synergistic effect to improve outcomes. While the cost of providing care for COPD or for heart failure is significant, it is most significant when there are untreated mental health issues occurring simultaneously in the same patient. By having the care delivered to those patients under the same roof, by providers that are working together, you have better outcomes. And we want to continue to see those types of things, and we'll support those through transformation grants and through making care more acceptable and more equitable. Dr. Morley, it's interesting listening to, uh, to your responses. You know, so much of what you talk about is innovation, but also what you talk about is being person-centered and really focused on what individuals need at the time that they need it. I want to turn it back to you for just a second. You, you've done a lot of different work. You've done a lot of outstanding work in your career. What stands out? Um, boy, there's just so many things that I could talk about. I think what stands out is that people are people. We do want to standardize opportunities. We want to standardize access. We want to standardize a whole list of things. But every time we talk about standardizing, there are some folks that hear, oh, cookie cutter, do the same thing for everyone. Well, that's not what we're talking about, because to the point that you just made a couple of minutes ago, while we want to standardize access and we want to standardize opportunities, we don't want to treat everybody this exactly the same. We do want to recognize what individuals need. And individuals, as it turns out, are individuals. And, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, about your economic background. Uh, you're going to end up with the same diseases, the same medical conditions, and you're entitled to the same levels of care. And whether you live in the city or live in a rural community, you'll find that people just want to get to know their doctor and they want their doctor to know them and they want to be treated as individuals by somebody who cares. Uh, one of my favorite expressions that I've heard over the years, patients want to know that you care before they care what you know. Mm. So Dr. Morley, you would worked for the Department of Corrections at a season of your career. I mean, you've had a really wonderful career. You've worked a lot of places. You know, what stands out from your season of working for the Department of Corrections? That was a learning curve that was um, a straight up uh, in terms of, of providing care. So uh, um, I've had spent quite a bit of time providing health care, but providing it in that environment is different than it is providing it in other environments. Um, the security issues that ensure safety for all of the people within the prison setting uh, are substantial and they can impact care. So it just makes a complicated system 
uh, one step, one substantial step more complicated. I, I think that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, um, yet again, to the point that I was just making a few minutes ago, people are people, whether they're in green overalls or whether they're walking around in business suits outside. They all want to know that, uh, that the physician that's there is there to care for and about them. And you know, they want to know that they care before they care what they know, no matter what the environment is that you're in. And I would imagine the same applies for your time at Albany Medical Center. Yes, uh, an, an academic medical center, uh, different than differently resourced and different challenges than in a rural community. Um, I, I certainly enjoy, I have spent 15 years at Albany Med in training and in other roles. And we would get people as transfers from other institutions that, other facilities that are fine facilities, but just not resourced the same way that Albany Med was. And we were always very happy to help out for those uh, institutions that were not able to take care of patients. They just didn't have the resources that we had at an Albany Medical Center, a true tertiary care facility. So, you know, by the time this airs, you'll help be retired, uh, which is interesting because you're retiring this week. I'm just curious, you know, four plus decades of medicine, public service. What are you looking forward to in retirement? Um, that's a really good question. You know, I'm going to spend a little more time thinking about my own health first. I, you know, I tried to, to live a balanced life and I didn't disregard my own health. But as I try and balance things, I still want to continue to be helpful to folks. There's no question that I am not going to be sitting in a rocking chair with a fishing pole. That's not going to be me. I intend to be as helpful as I can to as many people as I can in any way that I can. That's, that's my goal. But I will spend a little more time at the gym. I will spend a little more time thinking about uh, my own health and my wife as well. And so we will do that together. Uh, we look forward to having our own schedule so that we can continue to help folks, both of us, uh, but uh, on a schedule that uh, we're not rushing uh, as much as one has to, has to rush in, in this frenetic pace of life in government and in Albany. You know, it's interesting. You've had a career with purpose. Sounds like you're going to have a retirement with purpose as well, which is wonderful and well-earned indeed. You know, one of the things I think about it, you've done a nice job summarizing for us at the Department of Health. We do have a pretty large regulatory role. We regulate hospitals, nursing homes, some healthcare professionals, emergency medical services. We regulate a lot, um, but we also do help those who we regulate. You know, you summarized, well, how we help hospitals, not just financially, but with staffing. So there's a lot that we do at the New York State Department of Health as we help others. Our job is to help all the people all the time. You've been a big part of that, so for that, we thank you very much. So as we're wrapping up this season of New York Public Health Now, I first want to thank all of you, our listeners, for joining us for the conversation every other Tuesday. I also want to thank our production support teams here at the New York State Department of Health responsible for helping me to get the podcast into your player every other Tuesday. I want to thank McLean Bearhopt, Sam Miller, Kyle Coteri, Mike Wren, Alicia Biggs, Sarah Snyder, and of course our amazing co-host, Joanne Morin. Please do keep those emails coming. We've heard from so many of you with topic suggestions for future episodes, and I really enjoy reading your thoughts on our previous episodes. So if you want to email us, you can email publichealthnowpodcast at health.ny.gov. That is publichealthnowpodcast at health.ny.gov. We'll be back in late January for the next season of our New York Public Health Now podcast which you can find in your favorite podcast player like Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. Remember to search by our podcast title or by keyword NYSDOH. Then tap the subscribe or follow button to be notified when we release our first episode of Season 2. Now, Joanne, we'll be doing things a little bit differently in Season 2. That's right, Dr. McDonald. Unlike Season 1, where we focused on our own in-house experts here at the State Department of Health, For season two, we will be inviting partners from outside our agency to have interesting and lively discussions on a wide range of public health-related topics. I'm excited. You know, we're kicking off the winter season of New York Public Health Now podcast with a conversation with Office of People with Developmental Disabilities Commissioner Carrie Neifeld. I recently hosted a Commissioner's Medical Grand Rounds with Commissioner Neifeld, and we had an enlightening discussion about working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities across various healthcare settings, and how to better meet the needs of those individuals to help eliminate the barriers to care 
for those with developmental disabilities. I really hope you will join us. For New York Public Health Now, I'm Dr. Jim McDonald, Commissioner of the New York State Department of Health. I'm Joanne Morin. And I'm Dr. John Morley. And thank you for listening.